Yeah, hi, my name is Dr. Edward Siegel, a graduate of Berkeley, Michigan, Michigan State, MIT, Westinghouse Combustion Engineering, GE, PSE, and GBIAEA, many years. Son of Sidney Siegel, co-director of Oak Ridge in the beginning. Um, what I heard today is summarized best by uh, Harry Belafonte lyric. It was clear as mud, but it covered the ground. One of the problems that occurs is in this document, which I just got from someone here, which I presume is available. My goodness, people at Southwest Research in Institute found that alloy composition dominates things. That's in the scientific literature from the 50s. People like Sidney Siegel, or I know my father, Alvin Weinberg, director of Oak Ridge, fired for doubting alloy safety in brittle and into nuclear plants around 1970. What is San Onofre? It's a crime scene. What's the crime? Well, if I ripped off one of you for $5.3 billion, I'd be in prison forever, even after I was dead. So the questions to be asked is, what happened? The surfers at San Onofre, which I'm too fat and old to be one of, for 30 years one of the reactors removed. So what's the rush? And by the way, what happened in San Onofre isn't the worst thing. There's an old paperback about a meltdown, uh, like Fukushima. That would mean evacuation of Riverside, uh, San Diego, and Orange County for centuries. They would bankrupt the United States if no one was killed, and that's a big if. Who did it? Well, I don't know. Certainly Southern California has something to do with it. They trust EPRI. EPRI is their public relations arm. I was interviewed by Tra Chauncey Star and Ed Zabrowski, and when they heard about Alloy 182 welding problem, they were horrified. I was on an interview. They didn't hire me. I worked for a nasty Jewish PRICK named Hyman Rickover. He wasn't just afraid of Soviets. He was afraid of everyone. He was paranoid schizophrenic. He knew what he was doing. He won the Cold War from us as this fellow from the Nuclear Navy can attest. I have two books I'd just like to bring to people's attention. And by the way, if you want to find out about me, Google ANNA Mayo if leaks could kill. And if you want to find an article by me, go to flicker.com and put in the word giant magnetoresistance, read page 312. This is a book on fractography. What you do is you look at things with a microscope, just like a crime scene where someone is murdered, and you see what you see. Once it's put away in Idaho, they'll never find it again. It has to be examined here. Why? Because there's $5.3 billion in bills we're going to have to pay. Who's going to pay them? My feeling about nuclear fuel is the people who produce it should eat it for dinner. <laughs> and the Securities and Exchange Commission is watching very carefully. Lastly, in closing, a very interesting book, which you all can buy online. It's called De Re Metallica. I'll show you the front page. You can buy it from Dover for $30 by Georgius Agricola. It's the first book on metallurgy. It talks about why Roman, you see, there's nothing, need, you don't need anything hard in a nuclear reactor. Any woman knows this. Your cuticles when you're skiing, hard things are brittle, they break. You're not machining with a nuclear reactor or nuclear weapons or jet engines. De Re Metallica, translated by Herbert Clark Hoover, President of the United States. Publication takes interesting, 1550, half a millennium ago. Hard things break, Roman swords which stab through Hebrew and bronze shields in Greek broke because they were brittle. Why doesn't DOE, where the sins come from, NRC shouldn't be badly blamed? I'm, my thinking is Soviet sabotage when I was a little boy. Not my father, or Alvin Weinberg, not Eugene Bigner who founded it. I have some names, I've been looking at this for 40 years. How come the NRC, but especially the DOE, the only person doing anything with the DOE is LaFaro. Look up anything by Robert LaFaro, Alloy and Brittle Mitigation. And what happened at San Onofre may have saved us from a much worse than core meltdown, but why should we pay for it? If someone would like to pay my part of the stranded costs, I'll give you my name. If anyone wants to give me a business card, I can email you lots of stuff. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ed. Yes, sir. Thank you. Uh, Roger Johnson, San Clemente. Uh, earlier this evening you showed a slide, I think it was slide 20, in which you listed the reasons why uh, this plan should be denied. One of the reasons was that it would endanger public health and safety. And uh, I think this plan does endanger public health and safety. And uh, I think a lot of other people do too. And one of the uh, things that has been ignored in your report, and it's, it's been touched on here briefly, I'd like to focus on this, is terrorism. Um, the National Academy of Sciences was very concerned about this. In 2006, they wrote a report called Safety and Security of Commercial Spent Nuclear Fuel Storage. 
Um, and they addressed the whole report on that. Uh, I noticed on slide 38, you ignored terrorism. You listed all the possible things that could go wrong, and you ignored terrorism. Uh, one of the first things the National Academy of Sciences said is that nearly all the studies on the dangers of nuclear power plants focus on accidents related to equipment failure, and they completely ignore some of the other ones. So after 9-11, after terrorism became a reality. So here are a few things that they, that they said. They say attacks, this is page 35, attacks by knowledgeable terrorists with access to advanced weapons might cause considerable physical damage to spent nuclear plants. Um, then they go on to point out the U.S. commercial nuclear power plants are not required by the NRC to defend against air attacks. That's page 31. Uh, they go on to say that um, nuclear power plants are not designed to resist external terror attacks. Uh, there are currently no requirements in place to defend against large-scale terrorist attacks. Then they go on to say the committee, this committee, National Academy of Sciences, judges that some attacks involving uh, aircraft <coughs> would be feasible and could be carried out. And there's a crowding cladding fire that, well, with melted fuel pellets um, could release some of the radionuclides in the atmosphere and, and could be transported hundreds of miles downwind. Um, some of the other observations about dry casts, dry casts were designed to ensure storage. They were not designed to resist terrorist attacks. Um, and when they talk about fuel pools, they said uh, uh, this, this commission uh, concludes that there are scenarios that could lead to partial failure of the spent fuel pool walls, thereby resulting in partial or complete loss of fuel pool coolant. Uh, so it, it goes on and on, and, and um, the, the uh, one other thing they notice is that the problem with terrorism is they're site specific, and the NRC has come up with this generic plan, which means that all plants are equal. So it does not recognize that you have chosen to store waste on uh, earthquake faults and tsunami zone in the middle of the metropolitan areas and an area which is easily accessible by terrorists. It's two or 300 feet from public highways. Any truck bomb could go in there. Uh, the commission also said that to defend against truck bombs, you needed to have at least 400 feet of setback. Uh, Old Pacific Highway is 300 feet. Anybody can drive and park there and blow up a truck bomb. There's hardly a day in a week when truck bombs don't go off somewhere in the world. So this is a very dangerous site that you've chosen. And I think w one thing that you should, should be considered and is not being considered is that this is meant to be a temporary long-term, an oxymoron, storage facility. And if you're going to store it long-term temporary, let's store it long-term temporary somewhere else, like in a remote region where it's safe. You don't need a permanent solution. Thank you. Thank you, Roger. Uh, we're going to go over to this side of... Uh, of the room, and uh, we'll be coming back to you. Uh, but let's uh, let's go to Dan. Dan. Uh, my name is Daniel Dominguez. I'm the um, chief officer for the local union that represents the maintenance and operators at the plant. I'll keep my my statements short. Uh, I've worked at the plant for 32 years, 25 years as a reactor operator. Uh, and of those 32 years, my primary goal was to operate, uh, was to protect the health and safety of the public. And in the process, generate electricity uh, for the benefit of society. Uh, there's been a lot of talk. I want to cover one point, is that in my 32 years, I've had lots and lots of interaction with the NRC. And in my interactions, I've always found them very professional, and I've always found them that they had the same goal that I had, which was to protect the health and safety of the public. Uh, when the gentleman, I forget what it was, it said they put no price on safety, they do not put a price on safety. I can attest to that. That's been my experience. Uh, and finally, uh, <clears throat> the question about whether it's safer in the pool or safer in the ISFACI, for the last 15 years I've monitored the ISFC pad and it is safer in the ISFC. Thank you. 
Okay, thanks, Dan. And we're going to go to Patricia and Ruben and uh, Carlos. We're coming back to you. I didn't forget. Thank you. My name is Patricia Borschman. I live in Escondido. Um, I am concerned uh, about the safety of this proposed decommissioning plan that Edison has prepared, and they are uh, trying to expedite and you know make it uh, appear as if uh, it's no not going to be any problem or nothing's been overlooked and nothing's uh, there are no unforeseen risks. Um, I disagree. Um, I think that a lot of the technical comments that have been made are very credible, and I think, um, well, I think arguments on both sides have been made that are very technical and very credible. So I understand there's a dilemma, and a, the job is uh, un not finished. But what I would like to uh, emphasize is that you have the authority right now. There's nothing holding you back. You don't have to wait 90 days uh, to, uh, until this 90-day limit is up to ask for additional information. You have that authority right now. And I think that the, based on the concerns that have been presented in, uh, at your community engagement panel through the series of public meetings held by the Southern California Edison and their technical experts, there has been plenty of technical, highly technical, incredible concerns raised that aren't covered in S Edison's plan. Edison, you know, NRC, you're saying, as a lot of people have said, they put no, there is no cost placed, there is no price limit placed on safety. I, I agree with that because Edis Edison is supposed to be the one to absorbing the cost issues, and they're not. This plan they're prepared is the shortcut walk away, cheapest possible method. And it's not good enough for Southern California. There's no reason that, um, I don't think people realize, you know, they have better options, you know, that are used internationally, that provide the kind of protections that uh, this, this densely populated area deserves. Thank you. Thanks, Patricia. And Ruben. Thanks, Chip. Uh, thank you all for letting me speak here today. I'm Ruben Franco. I'm the president and CEO of the Orange County Hispanic Chamber of Commerce, and I live in South Orange County. Uh, given that we have a lack of leadership in Washington for any long-term solution to the problem of long-term storage, uh, it's my belief that moving the spent fuel, like the plan uh, suggests, uh, from the, the fuel from the pool to the cast storage would be a, a lot better solution, a lot safer solution and uh, hopefully we can move down that road. So I'd like to thank Edison and the NRC and the employees there for doing their part and trying to come to a solution to this and a resolution. So thank you. Thank you, Rudy. And let's go to this uh, gentleman right here and then we'll go over to, uh, to Carlos and then I'm gonna see if I can find some people. Thank you. Hi, my name is Carl Aldinger. I'm a concerned citizen from Fallbrook. Um, my question is, will there be a contingency plan for when inevitably a cask cracks or fractured? I know, Mr. Santos, you mentioned uh, the ability to weld them. It appears to me that that's the way these are formed in the first place. You create the container, insert the fuel, weld it. So naturally, you should be able to weld up any problems you have. Um, has the, the commission planning process considered having additional storage containers manufactured ahead of time. So we do have a catastrophic failure. You're not standing there looking around for who's going to create this thing that could take five years to create. We've seen in the past it takes an enormous amount of time to build uh, stuff that, that, that you guys require. Um, our steam generators took five, seven years, and I don't expect these con containers to take that long. But who knows what situation we're in 40 years from now. It, it may not be that easy for us to get more of those, and so it may make sense to try to procure those now. <coughs> um, I want to point out that Hanford and, and Witt uh, both indicate that a failure to plan for contingency creates a toxic mess um, that's very hard and not impossible to attend to quickly. Um, so I hope that um, in your thinking that it's not we we build the casks, we build the cement surrounding, and then we pray. 
I hope that there's an easy way to clean up any problem that you do determine that there is made with a cast, that you've thought about this ahead of time and said, it's okay, we've got this. We're not, we're not gonna send in troops for you know, four or seven months to go slowly clean up a mess. Um, in talking about the, uh, the desalination plant, it's worth noting that the Western Hemisphere's largest desalination plant uh, is currently being constructed five miles from this room we are standing in. That plant will provide human drinking water to many sitting in this building. And unlike Japanese officials, who have been very slow at lying through their teeth about the amount of emissions their ongoing nuclear disaster is leaking directly into the Pacific Ocean, three and one half years after the earthquake and tsunami, we will not be so polite if and when an accident at San Onofre spent fuel storage poisons our drinking water. The reverse osmosis system being built there is not designed to and is not likely capable of filtering out radio radionuclides. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So do you so want to uh, offer anything about what sure. happens if a cask breaks? Right. So oh. first, w what we're trying to do in these aging management programs is to set up the uh, guidelines or the guidance that says, you know, this much or no further, okay, in terms of degradation and what is acceptable, okay? Uh, that's first. Second is, is that uh, stainless steel repairs have been done in the nuclear industry for, for decades, probably longer than I've been alive. Okay, and it has, uh, they, they've had thousands in the 80s and 90s, thousands of wells that have had cracking in the reactor system, the stainless steel, the same stainless steel that, uh, that these are made out of and others are made out of that uh, have been repaired. Uh, overlays have been done for, for decades, okay? Uh, so there are technologies out there when, they are, when there are unique uh, issues, like what happened, I've been bringing up Coburg. That's a plant that had, that's right near the coast, breaking waves right next to, in South Africa, that had this same issue. And uh, their, their, their tank was very thin, so the typical methods of doing repairs was not appropriate, okay? So they went off and they did some uh, quick R&D and got it up, repairs done very quickly. It was an overlay, okay? But it was a unique overlay. So the capabilities out there are, are, are they're, they're there. They're there now, okay? Uh, just bringing it to bear to this side of the house, which is a dry cast storage site, is not that big of a deal in my, in my opinion. Okay. Um, but, and then the other issue was, uh, you said for, for casts that have been damaged beyond our threshold or to a point where, you know, we need to do something. You know, we have casks that are transfer casks as well as transportation casks that are at different sites that we could pull together or, you know, sometimes they're on, on individual site-specific sites, site-specific licenses will tend to have them right there on their site, and they can be stored within them and held and stopped uh, for having any issues. All right, thank you. Thank you, Al Carlos. Thank you. Try to make this short. Uh, I'm referring to off-site emergency planning. Uh, name is Carlos Silvera from the city of Dana Point. Uh, when we became a city in 1989, Southern California Edison installed a emergency response center at City Hall. Uh, we have not had to use that for San Onofre, but we did use it a couple years ago and we had a tsunami. It only measured six inches, but nevertheless, it was nice to have it. So I'm just asking is, will, will that facility be main, maintained uh, throughout the decommissioning? Uh, uh, let, let me speak to that. Uh, we, we've submitted a defueled emergency plan for, you know, that is based on the scenarios that can occur in decommissioning plants. Uh, we will, we have some offsite facilities the utility maintains. The offsite facilities that the counties and cities maintain will really be up to them in the future. We've talked to the Interjurisdictional Planning Commission, which is the agency that coordinates all offsite emergency planning, not just for nuclear issues, but for all hazards. And uh, that question really is for them they are certainly going to keep their emergency capabilities in place while the fuel pools are in service. Okay, and we, we do have someone from FEMA, but um, the interjurisdictional planning uh, committee, they couldn't be here tonight, but they did give me something that they wanted me to read into the record, very short. Uh, uh, the members of the Song's Interjurisdictional Planning Committee have committed to maintaining emergency response capabilities 
related to nuclear preparedness throughout the song's decommissioning process and to continue our multi-agency partnership to accomplish this, this goal. And uh, I'll read more of this if we have time, but I just wanted to get that on the record. And if you could just introduce yourself to us. Uh, my name is Richard Grunstrom, and I'm uh, the Technological Hazards Branch Chief for FEMA Region 9. And part of what we do is we oversee the Radiological Emergency Preparedness Program around the uh, off-site agencies around the nuclear power plants. The IPC, all the Interjurisdictional Planning Committee and all the local communities have had a very, very robust emergency response plan. And it's been exercised for years. It's uh, in a transition over the period of time, uh, like the gentleman mentioned, it was activated for the tsunami. It's now becoming an all hazards plan. Just because the San Onofre nuclear power plant is going to shut down, the plan is going to remain in place. They're still going to have a robust EOC, and they're still going to have the planning efforts uh, that they do now. Okay. And we're going to go to Jacqueline Wu, and I'll just read more of the Interjurisdictional Planning Committee as I'm walking over there. Uh, as a part of our ongoing emergency planning, we will retain the ability to receive information, independently monitor and assess conditions, and take actions to protect our residents, visitors, and emergency workers. This is Jacqueline. Thank you. I've been following the San Onofre whole spectacle through the news, and it's really eye-opening to come here and to hear from all these different perspectives, especially from those who actually work on site. Um, who put their lives on the line. My question is, is there a list of other agencies that we're working in collaboration with for the decommissioning effort? And if so, how can the public participate? Will there be any public hearings? Okay. Anybody want to take that on? I think it was a pretty straightforward question. Do you, do you understand it up there? What? When you're talking about other other agencies, you're talking about uh, federal agencies, state agencies. I mean, I'm I think any any other agencies that might be involved. Let, let me just make one quick comment. We focused our discussions tonight on NRC requirements for decommissioning and the post shutdown decommissioning activities report, the rated fuel management plan. Realize also the. The state of California, through the California Environmental Quality Act, also has some permitting reviews they will do, similar to what we did on Unit 1 activities in some cases. So there will be some state agencies involved. That is, you know, starting in the near future. I don't have a list per se, but if you stay pay attention to our songscommunity.com website as we proceed through the state permitting process for decommissioning activities, that information would be available. Uh, yeah, and FEMA, FEMA, obviously, right? Go ahead, Larry. No, I was going to say that, for example, Department of Transportation regulations that apply to the waste that will be leaving the site when decommissioning is going on, we actually enforce those regulations, but they are Department of Transportation regulations. There are also certain EPA considerations that we carry out as part of our regulatory process. With regards to the hearing question, Department, uh, I mentioned that when the license termination plan is submitted, there is an opportunity for a hearing. And if a body, or if a group or an individual seeks a hearing and is granted standing, then it goes through an adjudicatory process. But that's an actual legal hearing. Okay. It's not a, it's not a public exchange of information. It's an adjudicatory hearing. As opposed to a meeting. Thank you, Larry. If, if, uh, if let's I could, go, if I go could ahead. say one other thing, Diane. which is just that um, for any of the other licensing amendments that, that, that the Senate Opera has submitted to us for review as well. It's it just like with the license termination plan, there's an opportunity for a hearing uh, provided on each of those as well. So anyone who's interested or you know, wants to participate in that can, can make the request for those as well, such as the emergency plan that, uh, that, that Mr. Palmazano talked about previously. That's, that's, a, that's one of the licensing actions that'll, that are under, under review right now. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Doug. Uh, and uh, we're going to go to this gentleman here, but I wonder, does Steve, Steve Adams, Francis Bauer, or Dave Pizer still here? Okay, Dave. Excellent. 
Thank you. My name is Dave Pizer, and I am running for Congress right here in the 49th District. And San Onofre is obviously part of this district. And um, I'm running against Daryl Issa, in case you want to know that. So uh, the first thing I want to say is thank you for all your hard work to make sure that uh, make sure of the safety and well-being of our district with all the actions that you're taking. And I want to thank everybody who's in this audience, too, to bring your concerns. And the one concern of mine is that uh, according to the timeline, the Department of Energy is going to take this fuel off-site, and I'm concerned that that's never going to happen, uh, considering the history that's been going on so far with trying to find a permanent site for nuclear uh, spent fuel. So for that reason, I have two points. One is, I have, because of my serious concerns, I'd really like to see us put a plan in place to get the fuel off-site as soon as possible. And number two, if you cannot figure out a way to do that, I really think we should look at a longer term containment strategy with uh, the cast iron type uh, casks, something more permanent and durable that's going to last longer than the timeline that you've uh, put together. Thanks. Okay. Thank you. And let's go to Ted, Ted Quinn. Hi, I'm I'm Ted Quinn, and uh, also a CEP member like, like Dan and Gene Stone, I think. Um, I'd like to thank the NRC for sponsoring this meeting. Um, it's a pleasure to see uh, the, the factual data, and I'm going to emphasize the word factual data, being presented. In the CEP, we've had uh, multiple meetings, two workshops, to foster public and plan owner um, uh, exchanges on key issues. And it's, it's, it's continued tonight, even though this isn't a CEP meeting. The, the public interactions have been, have been great to see, but particularly the ones that are in a factual basis. Um, I would just like to comment, if Dr. Siegel is still here, uh, there's a good book about threats that called One Second After by William Fortune on the loss of electricity in a North Carolina sa town that I think is, is, is quite an interesting read. Thank you. Oh, okay. Thank you, Ted. Uh, Francis Bauer? Steve Adams. Okay, and Alice has left. Do you want to ask that question, Chair? Okay, we have a clar request with clarification from Sharon on a couple of dates. Um, the gentleman who who spoke about the DOE and the um, the waste confidence gave a date of 2048 for building an interim facility. And yet, uh, Mr. Pomisano talks about all the waste being removed by 2049. Um, there's something wrong with those dates. And I would just like somebody to clarify how those two dates work together. OK, and I think, uh, I think Keith's 2048 was based on what DOE actually stated they thought a repository would be ready in 2048. So why don't you talk and then we'll ask Tom. The, the distinction is that there were two facilities in DOE strategy. The first was a centralized interim storage facility that would be located somewhere in the U.S. Uh, and that would occur in the, the, the 2020s. So the, the fuel would be removed from the reactor facilities to this centralized facility. That would then be staged for a repository that would be available in 2048 for the final disposition of spent fuel. OK, and, and Tom, do you want to add, add no, anything? I think that clarifies the, the dates we're working from are based on Department of Energy information for the interim facility. So for a planning basis, that's what we're using at this point. We're obviously monitoring the situation. The 24-8 is a permanent repository. So our goal, quite frankly, is for the fuel to be removed as soon as DOE can remove it to an interim facility. And that's what our dates are based on. OK, and I just wanted to thank all of you. You've been a tremendous, tremendous group. And uh, I'm going to turn this over to the senior NRC official, Larry Camper, to Close the meeting out for us. Uh, 
Al Santos will be held hostage after the meeting. Okay, uh, so go ahead, Larry. Thank you, Chip. Um, before I make my closing comments and observations, I do want to ask uh, Dwayne, who's in our Office of Nuclear Security and Incident Response, several times terrorism has come up. And I, I asked Dwayne to say something about a concept called safeguards. We have other ways than environmental impact statements or safety reviews for addressing terrorism, and it's under the umbrella of safeguards. So, Dwayne, would you make a few comments about that to clarify for people how that works without getting into the details you can't get into? Yeah, I try to, yeah, that's one thing about security, a little bit more sensitive subject, so we don't talk about it as much. But one thing that's been mentioned a lot you know, during our discussions is, is that security is going to go away or go down. and so. I do want to let you know that NRC does have a process, and so the security will remain in place. We have a, um, a high, we require high assurance that security, um, um, that all the sites from operating, as it starts off operating to decommissioning through the SOC, that they maintain a specific level to go against what we call our design basis threat. And so that design basis threat is basically scenarios that's been made up of different types of threats. and. And each reactor, each decommissioning site has to make sure they maintain those, um, their security at that level. When we say that um, security is being changed, basically what we're saying is because the operations of the facility from an operating facility to a decommissioning facility changes, you reduce the area because, for example, you no longer have the reactor, you no longer have the auxiliary equipment that protects the reactor. So, of course, you don't have as much area to have to secure. So it's not that security goes away, it's just that it changes the structure so that we can maintain that same level of security. So we wanted to make sure it was clear that security is, is, is going to be there. The NRC does a very good job. We have a whole office dedicated to ensuring that different plants, including songs, will um, maintain their security even as they make changes. They have to submit those changes to us and we do review those changes to make sure that they still have that high level of assurance. So, I just wanted to make that point so that it's clear that, that the site will still be protected. And um, you know, that's, that's what also Doug was saying in regards to the, um, the you know, difference between spent food pool and, and the um, dry canisters and that the, the plant itself will be still secured. So that's why it wouldn't matter. So I hope that helps. Thank you. Thank you. Thank and Larry. Okay, thank you. Uh, first of all, let me thank everyone for all the comments, um, very insightful comments. And let me assure you that the meeting is being transcribed. The staff will review the transcript as we go through our review process, you know, tracking against the 90-day clock that's been mentioned several times over the evening. The staff will caucus following this meeting and uh, discuss the various things that we heard and, and will caucus as we look at the transcript and your comments will, in fact, be considered as we conduct our review. Um, the second thing I want to mention is, and I'll, I'll go back to the term, who can say no? Who can say no? We can say no. It is correct that we do not approve the PSDAR consistent with the existing commission policy. Why is the policy that way? Because in 1996, 1997, the commission determined that the activities that are conducted during decommissioning are bounded by the operations and safety considerations that take place during an operating reactor. There's nothing that's taking place during decommissioning that is extraordinary as compared to the safety and environmental considerations of an operating reactor. And therefore, the commission put in place the process that we have today, whereby the PSDAR would be submitted. Certain information would be provided in that PSDAR. And you've seen the contents of that in some of the slides tonight. And then the emphasis put then upon the ultimate end state of the site. What does the site look like from a radiological standpoint when that license is prepared to be terminated? Now, one can criticize that process, I understand that. I'm merely offering an explanation as to why it is the way that it is. Now, we ask questions. We have asked questions of other PSDARs in the past that have been submitted. We may find ourselves asking questions about this PSDAR. 
But I want to point out that the reason we ask the questions and the reason that we review the PSDAR is to ensure that our regulations are in fact met. We have the authority to stop this decommissioning or any other decommissioning at the PSDAR state if we can't get answers to the questions that lead us to believe that our regulations would be complied with. We have regu regulatory tools that would let us do that. So we have the authority to say no, even though we don't approve the PSDAR as such for the reasons I've just explained. So do understand that we do have that authority to say no. There's been a great deal of um, uh, talk about moving the fuel. I think uh, we all think that that's a very legitimate uh, concern. The, our country, our, we do not have a national policy at this point in place that leads to moving of the fuel to another location from the coast here. I think we all uh, prefer, would prefer that we did, but that's a national policy decision. It's not a decision that the SCE can make. It's not a decision that we can make. It's a national policy issue. What we have to do is make sure that this uh, decommissioning takes place in a safe manner and that the fuel that remains in dry cast storage on the pad is done safely and in a way that will protect public health and safety. I hear a great deal of interest in the cask of choice, in the cask performance considerations. Those are very fair questions. Those are very fair concerns. And we'll do everything that we can to continue to put information on our website that will um, enunciate the various studies and, and things that we're working on that Al commented on in his presentation as he answered questions. Why exemptions? Another fair question. The reason that we grant exemptions for things such as emergency preparedness and certain security considerations, operator qualifications when reactors move into decommissioning is because our regulations currently in Part 50 are designed around an operating reactor. We have not yet put in place a set of regulations that would be appropriate once the reactor had gone from operations into decommissioning. The reason that we haven't is in the year 2000, the staff started down the pathway of a rule that would articulate specifically what are the conditions that the reactors must be in when in a decommissioning mode. That rulemaking was from the back burner. It was postponed by the commission because at the time it was determined that we had higher priority rulemakings to work on that dealt with security in a post 9-11 environment. So I'll, I'll stop there. I think that uh, has been some excellent comments. We thank you for those. We will consider them and we'll look forward to communicating with you more as we go through the process.